Welcome to the StrokeCast. A Generation X stroke survivor explores rehab, recovery, the frontiers of neuroscience, and how to peel a banana with one hand. Hello, and welcome to Episode 7 of StrokeCast. I'm Bill Monroe. This week, I talked with Garrett Barrera about his stroke, recovery, career, and involvement with support groups. Uh, But before we go any further, I do want to give you a little content warning. Probably about 40% or so of the way into the interview, there is some discussion of suicidal thoughts. If you find yourself experiencing such thoughts, please, please talk with your doctor, your counselor, or any of your therapists. They can help you get the help that you need. And remember, those thoughts might seem like a good idea, but your brain may not be giving you the best input after stroke. Depression is particularly common in folks post-stroke, and as Will Wheaton of Internet and Star Trek fame often says, depression lies. But back to Garrett. Garrett is familiar to many stroke survivors in the Seattle area. He's led the Young Adult Stroke Survivors Group for many years and has helped hundreds of people connect with one another in that time. Garrett is a lifelong Seattle resident and an electrical engineering graduate of the University of Washington. He's built a career in engineering, applying ultrasound and related technology to industrial and consumer goods. Uh, Most folks probably have some technology that Garrett has worked on in their own home, like the wireless charging systems that allow us to set an electric toothbrush in a base to recharge overnight. Today, Garrett works as an engineering consultant from the home just south of Seattle that he shares with his wife of five years. He has two 30-something kids from an earlier marriage. And after 13 years at the helm, Garrett is turning over leadership of the Young Adult Stroke Survivors Group to... Well, yours truly. If I can manage it half as well as Garrett has, the group and the stroke and caregiver communities of Seattle will have a great future. Please wish me luck. Now, let's talk with Garrett. So, Garrett, thank you for joining us here on StrokeCast. Why don't you uh, share with us the story of, well, your stroke and how that came about? Yeah. Well, it was sort of out of the blue. I was I was reading email one night about 10 o'clock by myself. I had separated from my wife, and uh, I started getting a tingling in my right arm. I shook it off a little bit. I thought, oh, I just got a pinched nerve or something, and it wouldn't go away, and it started spreading to my leg. I stood up, and I said to myself, oh, what's going on? And my speech was slurred. At that point, I kind of realized that I was having a stroke or at least some sort of a brain event. I went in the uh, bathroom and I took three aspirin, which I'd heard you're supposed to do for a stroke. Now, it turned out for my particular type of stroke, that was the right thing to do. But if I was having a hemorrhagic stroke, that would have been exactly the wrong thing to do. Yeah, that, w- that would have been problematic. <laughs> exactly. So I called 911. I was all by myself at this time. I called 911. The emergency medical technician showed up and looked at me rather skeptically. I was only 48 years old at the time and in good health. I was nowhere near the risk group for strokes or any brain injuries. And they looked at me skeptically. They thought maybe I was having a panic attack. But they loaded me into the ambulance and off we went to the hospital. The siren wasn't on. The lights weren't on. We were just sort of, you know, going to the hospital. Meanwhile, I felt like I was dying in the back of the ambulance. Sure. I was trying to convey this to the guys. This is serious. My right side is, is dying. you got to get me to the hospital. They did. They put me through a CAT scan and some other scans down there and uh, admitted me into the hospital. The following day, it was pretty clear that I had had a stroke. My right side was pretty severely impaired. I was barely able to walk. I couldn't raise my arm. I couldn't control my hand very well. But after about a week in the hospital, I uh, went back home. I didn't do any hospital inpatient for this stroke. Uh, I just figured that I was going to rehab on my own. The doctors at that time couldn't tell exactly what I had. They said, we thought you had a vertebral artery dissection, which is a split in the inner lining of your vertebral artery. They thought that that had caused a clot, which broke off and gave me this cerebellar stroke. But they didn't have the direct evidence for that. They just thought that that was the most likely 
explanation. So their advice was to take it easy and just do my rehab at home. Well, I'm kind of a type A personality. <laughs> so to me, take it easy means uh, you can take a nap once in a while. But I began jogging. I tried to, to start running to get functionality back in my leg. I started playing the guitar again, forcing my hand to work. I was doing touch typing as much as I could to try and, and get my physical abilities back. And it was all fairly successful. I was beginning to rehabilitate pretty well. Uh, about three weeks after my stroke, my oldest son, was, who had been shopping for a motorcycle, found one down in the Central Oregon coast. And he didn't have his motorcycle endorsement at the time, so he asked me, he said, Dad, do you feel good enough to ride the bike back for me? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm really doing pretty well, and you know, that'll help me with my rehabilitation. And that sounds like a, like just a fun favor, an awesome thing to do. Exactly. An excuse to ride a motorcycle up from the Oregon coast. Yeah, exactly. So I, we drove down there to the Oregon coast and tested out the bike and he liked it and bought it. And I hopped on the thing and immediately began wondering, am I really doing the right thing here? For one thing, it was a kind of a, a low posture bike. So my head was up and the helmet was pushing right against the back of my neck where unbeknownst to me, my vertebral artery, artery dissection had right. occurred. Sort of like, so your head is already leaning back like when you're looking through the lower part of a pair of glasses. Exactly, yeah, yeah. I was leaning forward on the bike and my head was up. So uh, it was also a little bit late by this time. It was uh, probably seven o'clock by the time we left this guy's home and we decided to take an inland highway route. It got dark. It, it really began to get a little bit frightening. I was, I was able to control the bike okay, but I but did not feel confident on it. We pounded up by five for a while and ended up staying overnight in Portland. I hopped back on the bike the following morning and got all the way back home. Well, by that time I was really starting to get woozy. I uh -huh. was uh, starting, my stroke symptoms were starting to recur and the following day I had the worst nausea and malaise that I have ever felt. I asked my, uh, my other son who was home at the time to drive me back to the hospital. I was readmitted with another stroke. This time, uh, what had happened was the split in my uh, artery, my vertebral artery, had pushed up into my brain and was physically blocking off smaller blood vessels in my cerebellum. Oh, wow. So, and this time it was on my left side. My left side was completely paralyzed the following day. And I ended up being in the hospital for a total of a month, of a month for that one. So, I think of it as one stroke, but it really was two. And the second one was probably avoidable. If I had known about the VAD, vertebral artery dissection, mm -hmm. and had you know really been as careful as I should have been, it probably wouldn't have happened. But there were mistakes all along, made by me and made by the doctors in my stroke. So anyhow, after a month of uh, intensive care, then the hospital ward, then the rehab unit at Northwest Hospital, I went back home and I began the really hard work of rehabilitating at home. I had a nurse come in periodically, my sister, bless her heart, she dropped her life in New Mexico and came up to take care of me. And uh, excuse me, I'm uh, one of the, the effects of my stroke, I should explain to your listeners, is called uh, pseudo-bulbar affect, or also known as emotional liability. It means that I don't have very good control of my emotions anymore, and if something sentimental comes up or or a little weepy, I'm crying like a baby. And if, it's, if something a little funny comes along, I'd laugh hysterically. So <clears throat> I'm a real mess at a sentimental movie. <laughs> and this, this PBA, or pseudobulbar affect, was particularly strong right after my stroke. For, a, for about two or three weeks, my sister was a little worried. She thought I was completely insane. The stupidest things, and I would laugh hysterically until my stomach ached. I couldn't stop. And, you know, the, the kind of sappiest sort of things I do crying like a baby. Anyway, that's, that's tempered a lot, but still it kind of overwhelms me. And when I, when I talk about certain sentimental things, I'm liable to break down and cry. It, it's interesting when you talk about the emotional ability. Uh, I had that a lot more in the first couple of weeks post-stroke as well. And just trying to explain to my girlfriend that, no, I'm okay. Yes, I know I'm crying, but mm -hmm. it's just a thing that's happening. I'm, yeah. Fine. Yeah. Don't so you, worry. you were sort of aware that that could happen, and you allayed her fears. The um, the hospital, the I mean, the staff at uh, that I had in 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 
rehab and uh, in uh, just in my inpatient experience on neuro, they were very good about telling me things and yeah. I was very aggressive about asking questions. Good, good, so you were prepared. I, they, they had sort of explained it to me and I had, I had discovered it in the hospital that my emotions were completely off the rails. So, I, but it was really difficult to get used to. I, I finally come to sort of uh, accept it and even appreciate it. I feel like I feel like my emotions wash over me like an ocean wave, and it feels good to feel that. I really know what I'm feeling mm -hmm. that way. To sort of engage with sort of another part of the reality of your life, yeah. Um, and especially with a background as an engineer, that's yeah. probably very rational. Not something you were heavily involved with. Exactly. You know. Well, I, I was a fairly emotional guy okay. before my stroke, but it's become almost pathological now. Gotcha. But like I said, it's it's really in check now. It doesn't bother me mm -hmm. too much. Once in a while, I'll burst out into tears in the grocery store line, but it's not very often. And uh, I, like I say, I, I have kind of kind of appreciated now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great, um, you know, and, and it's interesting because, you know, as I see in a lot of the support groups online, that a lot of people ask questions about this, and they're like, "What is, what is wrong with me? Why am I reacting right. this way?" It's like, you know, it's perfectly normal. Yeah. This is what happens. It is. And it happens to a variety of stroke victims too. You know, mm -hmm. regardless, it's it seems very strange to me that regardless of where your stroke happens in your brain you can get this emotional liability. So I think it's very strange. Right. E emotional control, I think, must be distributed throughout your brain. So, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of where your stroke occurs, it can affect your emotional stability. Right, and yeah, yeah, I guess it's one of those things that if it's a fear or flight thing, that's very low in the brain. If it's more nuanced emotions, that's sort of very high function in the brain. Yeah, and, frontal lobe. And those can be some of the things that are just you know, last of last evolved can sometimes be the hardest, the weakest to maintain. Right. You've done very well in your recovery over the uh, over the years since then. And what what's been most helpful in your recovery? I've thought about that. Tried to put a finger on it. I think a big part of it was working as hard as I possibly could shortly after the stroke. I had been told that the first six months were really crucial in stroke recovery. And that seems to be the time when the brain is the most plastic and the most able to recover. And that was true for me too. I kind of hit a recovery wall after about five or six months. So I worked really hard up to that point and I got a lot of functionality back in my left side, my left arm and, and leg. I still was not able to play the guitar and piano again, but I, I really got a lot of functionality back. So I think that was key. I think working really hard right after your stroke is key. Even though that's the last thing you feel like doing. I mean, after your stroke, you're fatigued, you're shell-shocked, your life's been turned upside down, you don't know what to do, but um, it's really critical to work as hard as you possibly can. Just wear yourself out on rehab. And I think, I think probably uh, continuing to stay in physical shape. I was not in very good physical shape when my stroke occurred. But since then, I've taken on a regular program of working out and walking, even though I don't enjoy walking. I know it's good for me. And uh, I think that's helped with my recovery, too. So how did, how did your stroke affect your business? Um, it was difficult in the sense that I didn't have a big company to take care of me and to uh, allow me to ease back into work. As soon as I had my stroke, I stopped making money. And I went into financial freefall. Uh, fortunately, I had a good insurance policy at the time with Primera, and I mean, thank goodness for that. I've just become a health insurance evangelist <laughs> since then. But mm -hmm. uh, for several months, for about three months, I really wasn't able to work at least full time. I could put in an hour or two. I was very fortunate in that one of my major clients stayed with me through the stroke. Um, they they allowed me to do the rehabilitation that I needed, and after about three months, I was able to give them pretty much full-time work again. So that, I was in free fall for a while, but I managed to get back into the workflow and into full-time. I was probably full-time after six months. So obviously you did a ton of the work and a ton of the recovery prior to that six month mark. Right. Um, your recovery has continued after that six months? Uh, yes, it has. It's been, the physical recovery has been very slow, but 
uh, since the, the six months, but it is occurring. I can see it. My wife tells me she can see it. Um, some other things, I, I, I was fortunate in my stroke not to have any language effects. So many stroke survivors end up with aphasia, which, which is difficulty in comprehending or expressing language. That didn't happen to me. But for those people I've noticed in my support groups that uh, that can improve significantly over many years. It's kind of funny, but the, the physical effects tend to taper off after six months, but some of the other cognitive effects from a stroke can improve for years and years. It's just a matter of a lot of hard work. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, the things you've seen uh, in people in the in your support group, and so how did you get involved in the uh, support group in the Young Adult Stroke Survivors Group? Well, when I was in the hospital, somebody brought by some flyers of things I may want to pursue once I was out of the hospital, and among them was a flyer about the Young Adult Stroke Survivors. And I've never been much of a joiner. I've always been kind of a loner, and I thought, well, yeah, stroke group, you know, that's not for me. I'm not a, I'm not a group person. <laughs> well, after about six months, um, I, I began to slow down in my physical rehabilitation, and the fantasy that I had of being Superman of rehabilitation and coming back 100% began to crumble and, and crack a little bit. I started going into a pretty bad depression, maybe five months after my stroke. And I sort of hit bottom shortly shortly after that. And uh, I, I began at that time, well, okay, the, my epiphany really was when I realized as an engineer, I, if I were gonna kill myself, I would wanna do it in kind of an efficient way. <laughs> I didn't, I, I didn't really think about it like that uh -huh. at the time, but it's, that's really what was going through my head. And I thought, well, okay, I could just kill myself, and, but that would be kind of a waste. I mean, what would happen to all the stuff that I left behind? And then I began to realize that uh, the way I put it to myself was I could either take my life or I could give it away. And um, I, re I realized that... Uh, that I could still do stuff like spooning out soup at a soup kitchen or reading to old people or something like that, that that could provide a great deal of benefit to other people. And I could, if I wanted to, I could literally spend every penny that I had, give everything away in my life, and then kill myself. That would be a much more efficient way to do it. But once I'd made that realization, and once I'd started uh, doing volunteer work, in uh, engaging more in the community, uh, my life began to come back and I began to pull out of my depression. Uh, about that time, I began going to the Young Adult Stroke Survivors and I was so impressed from the, from the very first meeting that I attended, the acceptance that I felt there of the other people in the group. I showed up the first time a little bit late. I guess I'd forgotten what the meeting time was, but I showed up late right during the uh, during a, a sort of a presentation to the group of a guy who was really struggling with language. He had pretty serious aphasia, but the entire group was silent and rapt and listening to this guy and allowing him to find to find his own words and to express himself in his own way. And I, I realized how uh, healthy and nurturing that was for both the guy and the rest of the group. Every, there was such a bond of love there. And um, I began attending the group pretty regularly after that. And uh, as I was coming out of my depression and, and coming to grips with what had happened as a result of my stroke, I, uh, <clears throat> I felt that each month when I attended a group meeting, my spirits would shoot up and then during the course of the next month, they'd gradually fall. <laughs> and then I'd go to another meeting and they'd shoot up again and they'd gradually fall. Well, for the, for the first year or two of attending the group, it was like that. But as I began to get my strength back and, and get my footing back, I began to be able to help more in the group. I, I became more of a giver than a receiver in the group. Um, I became involved as a leader with the group not long after I started with the group. It was maybe six months 
when the leader at the time said, well, it's time for me to step down. Is there anybody who would like to take over? And I kind of <laughs> swallowed hard and he said, well, I'll, I'll give it a try. And it ended up being one of the greatest things that's ever happened to me. And, um, I, uh, so I took over in April of 2005 and it's been as of this month it's been 13 years now that i've been leading the group wow that's that's amazing it's it's really amazing how powerful it is to actually go out and engage with other people absolutely uh, and especially people who are have a similar experience yep. I, think, I think so many stroke survivors find themselves suddenly being isolated you know friends and family who you know, may disappear because they don't know how to deal and they right. don't, and they've got their own worries in their own life. And yeah, and that's, that's tough. Yeah. And, that's and tough. even, even the very best friends and family who are supportive and trying to help you, you don't really understand what it's like until you've had a brain injury. You can, as a brain injury survivor, you can try and explain it, but the feeling is so alien and so completely different from any normal experience that your friends and family really don't understand, even though they want to and they try to. So once I got in with the young adult stroke survivors, I realized that here was a group that was going through the same things that I felt. I could see the symptoms in them, uh, understanding from what they were saying, I could understand that, uh, that they were going through the same thing I was. And there's something just uh, unbelievably supportive about that, knowing that you're with it. It's almost like you're in an exclusive club and <laughs> everybody everybody knows the secret code words. But <laughs> that, I found that very helpful. I, uh, I met up with a group of uh, disabled folks on the cruise I was recently on and I was the newest to this sort of lifestyle. And, you know, one of them is like, so welcome to the club. The, yeah, the, exactly. The, the, the do's really suck, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to put it, yeah. <laughs> so 13 years is a long time in general, and with things we've seen happening in the digital world, obviously, it's that's an eternity. An eternity. Yeah. And what most people don't realize until you start looking into it is that what's happened in neurology over the last 13 years is has been kind of amazing. The evolutions yes. in neuroplasticity and and all sorts of this other stuff going around. But with the how has the group itself evolved and changed over those last 13 years? That's a good question. The, the group has actually gotten a lot bigger. I've been a very enthusiastic booster of the group and I, um, I made our presence known to hospitals in the area and on various websites, the American Heart Association, National Stroke Association. So I tried to kind of be a big booster for the group and attendance uh, went up from about oh, 10 or 12 when I first started with the group up to, well, for a while at Northwest Hospital when we were meeting there, we were seeing regularly 60 or 70 people in group meetings. But okay, so the, the group has changed in size. There's been a, a larger number of people. Um, in terms of the character of the members, I don't think it's changed much. There's There's been a wide variety of members from the from the fairly seriously disabled to the very slightly disabled and there's been a great variety of types of disability some people have language and cognitive problems some people have more physical problems but uh, the nature of brain injury really hasn't changed much in that time we try to have speakers each month that uh, present information that's of use to the group and some of that has evolved and changed neuroplasticity and the discovery of, of how prevalent it really is has become a, a big issue in some of the speakers in our group. But um, I would say that the, the group really hasn't changed a lot. It's The members have changed. We've got new members. Some of the old members don't come. But uh, generally, unfortunately, brain injury remains about the same. Sure. And uh, yeah, one of the things that I find interesting about the group is that it is the young adult stroke survivors group but it's really the young and young at heart yes. because the the age or the variety of ages in the group is really, really, really quite wide. Great. Yes, we we actually had a girl who was eight years old. She was our youngest attendee, 
and then we've got people in their 80s now. So right. it's, you know, in fact, um, shortly after I took over the group, there really wasn't a name for the group. They'd started off on the East Side calling themselves East Side Stroke something or other. And then there, you know, there's some people call it Stroke Group, some people call it Stroke Club or something. <laughs> so we sort of, for a couple of meetings, we uh, batted back and forth what we were going to call the group and what our identity was. And we really discussed the, the term young for quite a while. And we ended up keeping the, the term young because we try and focus on people who have strokes in their midlife and they've still got kids to raise, they've got jobs to get back to, they're, you know, they're kind of in, in the middle of their lives. There are plenty of stroke support groups for the elderly, right. which have a different set of needs. Sure. But we're, we're a very inclusive group and we, like I said, we've got people from 8 years old to 80 in the group but we call ourselves the young stroke young adult stroke survivor survivors primarily to kind of differentiate us from the groups of the elderly when we look at how the demographics are shifting with higher percentage of stroke victims now being younger than ever before yeah. it's you know it really knows no age limit and is really all over the place and thinking about now we've got to historically most folks think of caring for stroke survivors as We've got to care for people for the next 10 or 20 years of life. Right. And now we're seeing more and more where it's the next 30, 40, 50, 60 years right. of life. Yeah. Have to be a part of that. Yeah. And, you know, that's difficult for the survivor. They've got to find a new way, a new life and compensations for things that they can no longer do. And it's also, uh, it's hard on society. It's difficult for society to um, uh, assimilate them and accommodate their needs. Right, absolutely. I think we're seeing some of the, the broader implementations of things like the Americans with Disabilities Act and greater accessibility in buildings and things like that. Right. A lot of things that I never realized were accessibility features, I now realize are accessibility yeah. features like door handles instead of door knobs. And sure. Just those little things that come into life more. Right. Good point. That, that benefit more and more uh, folks. With this amazing tenure of running a support group, what what tips would you have for anybody out there who's thinking about starting their own support group in their community or running a support group? Yeah, that's a good question. There's a lot of um, information online. The National Stroke Association has a good uh, document about uh, it, just that. It's tips for, for people running their own support group. I would say um, that you want to you wanna publish your group as much as possible. Let all the local area hospitals know about it, therapists, uh, uh, organizations that have anything to do with brain injury. There's a, we're meeting right now at Provale out in the north end of Seattle, and they're a brain injury recovery group, so it's good for them to know about us. So I would, I would suggest plenty of publicity. I would suggest a website if the leader or a person in the group is... Uh, tech savvy and can can work with a with any kind of a website there are plenty of easy websites to put together I think that's important I know that a lot of people find us by doing a web search and um, I think it's important to keep the meetings um, varied I, it's good to have it's good to have speakers sometimes and it's also good to just have kind of heart-to-heart -heart talks one of the things that we've done in the years that I've been leading the group and the fellow who led the group before me was um, when we didn't have a scheduled activity, we would literally go around the room and ask each person to tell us their story. In five or ten minutes, they would explain the entire story of their stroke. And there's, there's multiple benefits to that. For one, when, when you explain the difficulties that you've had or that you had with your stroke, others can relate and they can make suggestions that might help you work around those difficulties. It's also just cathartic to tell your story. And and when you do it when you do it many times, it, it's really funny to listen to a given person tell their story over many different times and you can you can hear them recalling certain things that they'd forgotten before and in a way they kind of uh, streamline and encapsulate the whole experience to themselves and in their own mind and that's a that's a valuable thing and it also some of the some of the most moving meetings that we've had 
have been people expressing their stories, telling their stories, and other people uh, lending support or, or even just commiserating with them. So, so that's valuable. I would do that. I would do a mix of that and uh, having speakers of interest to the group. You know, and that, you know, as people continue to tell their stories, stories are what's so fundamental. It's very to, human. Uh, it's very, very human. It's how, you know, we've shared our histories over hundreds of the centuries. Yeah. It's the things we continue to go back to are it are stories and it's you know tv is so dominant today because everybody wants to hear stories social media has grown up so much because everybody wants to be heard wants to be recognized right. and that's i think why we see so many of these platforms now and there's such power in that yeah so you know, what do you wish that, you know, more stroke survivors and, and caregivers knew uh, as they go into this new experience, uh, you know, just after having their experience or a year or so right. into it? I think, I think probably two things. I think the importance of uh, strenuous rehab, even though it's the last thing you feel like doing, the importance of strenuous rehab. Uh, okay, three things. I said two, but I'm three. <laughs> <laughs> also... Um, contact with other people, social interaction, time for recreation when you're not busting your buns doing your rehab. And then number three, I think the value of support groups. I, for one, was, like I said, was not a, a group guy. I was not a joiner. But it, it just the being in a group, first as a recipient and then later as a, as a helper in the group, I think that's extremely valuable. Oh, four things. Okay, something else, <laughs> something else just came to mind. Um, volunteering. Volunteering sounds so banal and so, you know, maybe boring and stupid, but the idea of volunteering and actually just giving of yourself with no expectation of return, there's something so incredibly fulfilling about that. And, and, um, and no matter how bad your stroke was, you can volunteer, you can help somebody. Somebody out there needs your help. And it's so fulfilling to do that. I just can't, I can't say that enough. That's awesome. And you know, you know, you mentioned that it sounds stupid. And one of the things that I have found more and more again, and I continue to relearn, and that has been helpful in my therapy too, when the therapist asked me to do something that doesn't make sense to me, is that if it's stupid and it works, it's not stupid. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's a good bumper sticker. <laughs> <laughs> so... Great. So this has been fantastic. Are there any other projects or organizations you'd like to uh, talk about? Anything to plug? I think uh, I think the National Stroke Association is doing a wonderful job. They're uh, they they make materials available for free to stroke group leaders, and they're a great resource for for finding help. And uh, they 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 have a free magazine that you can subscribe to that's full of good tips and stories. I think they're a great organization. And our group's parent organization, the American Heart Association, is also excellent. They've got their, they've um, sort of branched out their, their charter to include not just issues with the heart and heart health, but they're also focused in large part on stroke and stroke recovery. And uh, they have a fundraiser walk every year. It's the, it's the Heart and Stroke Walk. Uh, they, they're, they're very active and helpful, too. So I'd say the NSA and the AHA, two great organizations. Awesome. And uh, we'll definitely have all those links on the, uh, on the site very so good. you can learn more. But I'm happy to take email if somebody wants to uh, contact me by email or through the Young Adult Stroke Survivors. I'm going to continue to be involved there. You know, people have different, um, different preferred methods of communication. And <clears throat> part of my stroke effect was um, it affected the muscles of speech so it's actually kind of difficult for me to enunciate and to speak especially for extended periods of time so the phone to me is a little stressful and a little difficult and but yet I can type like a banshee I can type 50 <laughs> words a minute nice. so you know that's fine so I like a, a written form of communication like that an email is really good for me and I welcome contact, and I would love to hear from anybody over my email. 
Awesome, fantastic, and we'll get that uh, that link on the uh, on Strobecast yeah. as well. Well, Garrett, thank you very much for uh, joining us this You're week. You're very welcome, Bill. Yeah, thank you so much. You can find all those links that Garrett mentioned in the show notes over at Strokecast.com, Episode 7. And now, our Hack of the Week. When I was in the hospital, I asked one of my rehab doctors about drinking alcohol post-stroke. We talked about it, and she said that moderate consumption was okay in my case. Actually, what she said was, just don't drown your brain in it. So let's talk about opening a beer bottle with one hand. Now, I should probably do it the right way and just mount a bottle opener on the wall. But until I get around to doing that, I need another technique. When I could use two hands, I would hold the bottle in one and pry the bottle cap up with a bottle opener from my other hand. So the bottle opener moves up while the bottle moves down or in a slight arc. But now my left hand isn't strong enough to hold the bottle and levering the cap off requires too much force to trust the bottle to just stay still on the counter. My solution, after some trial and error, is to position the bottle opener on the bottle like I normally would. Then I hold the neck of the bottle with my thumb, my ring finger, and my pinky. My index and middle finger hold the bottle opener in place. Then I pick all of this up and hold everything at the edge of the counter. Now, I position my index and middle finger on top of the opener to hold it in place, while the bottom side of the opener lays on top of the counter. Then I pull my hand down using the counter to pry the bottle opener up and pop the lid off. And now, once again, I can enjoy the occasional tasty beer. Of course, depending on the size of your hands, you may need to experiment with finger placement a bit, but the core principle is to use the kitchen counter to pop that lid off. Or, you know, just do it the right way and mount a bottle opener to the wall. Well, that's it for this week. If you want to contact Garrett or check out any of the organizations and resources that he mentioned, head on over to strokecast.com, episode 7. And while you're there, leave a comment on this post and tell us what you think. Subscribe to Strokecast in your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. And as always, don't get best, get better. Thanks a lot, and I'll talk to you next week. The Strokecast, Bill Monroe, and Bill's guests provide general information and entertainment not medical advice. Please do not make any changes to your treatment plan or the execution of your treatment plan without first consulting your personal doctor or medical team. The Stroke Cast is a proud production of the Currently Speaking Podcast Network.